I'm here speaking about um, focal therapy for cryoablation and being from New Orleans and coming up to Chicago in November. I certainly felt as if it were uh, a blast of cold coming up here. Um, I have a handful of disclosures. I'm not going to be mentioning any of these companies specifically in this talk today. Um, when you're thinking about cryotherapy, I think one of the most important things in looking at outcomes is understanding mechanism for cell death, because I think that once you understand that, it helps you understand why you have either functional changes or why you have oncologic success. And so when you stick your needles in and you cause the freezing, that freezing extracts the water molecules out of the cell itself. So you end up with this hyperosmolar situation within the cell itself, and that leads down to an apoptotic pathway. You get some crystals that form within the phospholipid bilayer, and that causes some um, cell death. And that mechanism, once again, apoptotic. Now, importantly, in the surrounding tissue, you get vascular compromise due to capillary and endothelial lining damage. And because of that occurring and that compromise associated with it, I think that leads to many of the complications or potential benefits of cryotherapy down the road. Now, when you look at the JU consensus, uh, and this was published many years ago, you need to be doing two freezes, you need a, a, a rapid freeze, uh, and you're aiming for minus 40 degrees. When looking at the cryotherapy data, we have to remember that cryotherapy has far and away been the longest of the mo these modalities utilized, right? I mean, this has been around since the early 90s. And since it was around since the early 90s, a lot of the data that has been previously published about cryotherapy really comes from what I would consider the pre-MRI era. Now, I know a lot of people in this room are sort of MRI pioneers, and, I, and at, as Arvin mentioned, at the NCI, we very much were. But even in Louisiana, that's 2000. 18, 2019 in terms of most patients getting MRI before treatment. And so it's really tough to utilize some of that old data in terms of where we are currently. And I think that as you look at sort of some of the larger outcomes, I mean, this was published a couple of years ago looking at the SEER database. And what did they see? They saw that there was no change in um, in terms of overall cancer-specific survival, but there's a huge deficit in terms of uh, overall survival for patients undergoing cryotherapy. And what does that tell us? That tells us that we're using cryotherapy in a very different subset selection of men. And I think that when you look at the larger subset, I mean, this is from the NCTB, 80% essentially of patients who are getting ablative therapies in prostate cancer are getting them in the cryotherapy setting. Now. Because this is done mostly in patients diagnosed early on, 2010 to 2012, mostly in rural areas. So if you're looking at, you're getting a, a cryotherapy in a rural area, you have to think that these are men who don't have access to MRI, and these are mostly in men who are a little bit older. So I don't think that much of the data that comes from a national database is really going to be representative of what we're talking about for focal cryo. And so since that's the case, I think what we really need to focus on individual institutions and how those institutions have been able to publish. So this, I think, is a, a very good assessment of this. This is 143 men, two free saw cycles down done in UCLA. This was uh, Lenny Marx's group. They looked at biopsies of both six and 18 months following treatment. What did they find? Well, they found, number one, they used very, in, uh, very changes in prostate volume. It used to be that you would try and shoot for about under 60 cc's would really be where you're going for prostate volume in terms of cryotherapy, but almost a quarter of their patients had volumes larger than that. So this really is a targeted ablation. What do they see? They say that if you have more advanced or higher risk disease, grade group three, you are more likely to fail, and I think that that's pretty well established, and that's about 40% of their men are have, gonna have grade group two or above on biopsy at 18 months. 30% uh, 30 of those are at six months. This is from the group in Creighton, Ohio. This is 163 patients. They use a slightly different um, definition for recurrence, and I think that we're gonna circle back to that later, but I think that's really important in terms of how you determine success in this cohort. What you'll see is that from this group, when you're looking at Phoenix or Astro criteria, picking between the two, you see that you're somewhere in that 70-ish percent range here for men with grade group two or three disease, which is your intermediate risk patients and really the patients that we've been focusing on here in this conference. Are there patient-specific issues that might lead to improvement in outcomes? Oh, I'm sorry, this is one more of these studies, and this is from Tom Palasic's group, 10 years of follow-up, 80 patients, and essentially the same thing. You're looking at the 60 to 70 percent range for that time point. Now, patient-specific issues associated with this. This is coming from the cold registry, and they're looking at PSA recurrence. And is PSA recurrence, in terms of a definition for uh, failure, 
who is going to fail. And essentially what they say is that men with larger prostates are more likely to fail because they're going to have more BPH tissue in addition. So if you're doing a focal ablation, their PSA is going to be higher. But their biopsy results were exactly opposite. So it's tough to really identify who's really going to be the perfect patient for this. Jim Hughes group looked at this, and this is up in New York, and they were looking at whether or not men had visible or uh, invisible MRI-suspected lesions. And I think that we, as a, a group, generally think that if you have MRI-identifiable lesions, it's probably a slightly more aggressive disease than the invisible lesion. And I think that they didn't find any data to support that, and they're early, and I certainly think this is early looking at two to three year outcomes, but I think that as you move further from this, you will see that those curves will probably start moving a little further apart. So oncologically, I think that we're where we need to be in terms of cryotherapy, particularly for focal disease. How about functionally? Patients do have a decrease in urinary function immediately following therapy, and I think that's pretty well established. Looking at the EPIC questionnaire, you see that there is a decrease at that one-month time period. It sort of comes back. It's no longer statistically significant at three months, and then sort of stabilizes at about that 12-month time point. Sexual function, I think, is slightly different. So in terms of sexual function, you do have a pretty substantial decrease in sexual function at one month. That decrease stays with you through that six-month time period, and while not statistically significantly different at the 12-month time period, that is a clinically significant difference. And I think that we need to counsel our patients that they don't return to full function following cryotherapy. Bowel function, you do have a slightly statistically difference in in function at that one month time point, although the clinical significance is that is not substantial. What you will see, and this I think circles back to how our, the tissue just dies and, um, and the vascular compromise is that as you destroy more tissue, you will have worse outcomes in terms of sexual function. So as you destroy, this is focal versus hemi versus subtotal ablation, you can see those curves are pretty well separated. If you are treating a more focal lesion, you are less likely to cause contralateral damage, and that makes sense. Now, the opposite is true for urinary function. So as you destroy more tissue, most of these patients will have actually improvement in their urinary function, particularly when it comes to obstructive and irritative symptoms. And you can see that's the exact opposite here. So for hemiablations, these patients have much better AUS IPS, uh, IPSS scores at that 6, 12, 24-month time point, and that's sustained throughout following treatment. Circling back, and this goes back to this as you, uh, these, how these patients respond from a urinary function, patients actually report improvement in their urinary function for the majority of patients who are undergoing uh, cryoablative therapy. And that really comes mostly from their obstructive and irritative symptoms. Now, sexual function recovery is going to be clearly dependent on where lesions are located. So for patients who have disease near the neurovascular bundle, these are the patients who are going to have the most vascular compromise, and those are the patients who are going to have the worst sexual function outcomes. However, when you have lesions not near the neurovascular bundle, and one of the reasons why this is a pretty attractive therapy, particularly for apical lesions, is that these lesions are destroyed, and they, when they are not near the neurovascular bundle, you can really preserve that urinary or sexual function. One of the questions that arises really in cryotherapy is how to follow up these patients, and I think that that's really important to assess. This group, 75 patients, focal therapy, they identified who had residual gray group 2 disease on repeat biopsy. So 12 of their patients had repeat biopsies. What's, what's fascinating is that the, of these men, 90% of them had Gleason gray group 2 or above in invisible lesions, so pyreds 1, 2, or potentially 3 lesions. And I think that's pretty common when you look at their freedom from failures, and this is also looking at visible versus invisible disease, you couldn't determine who was going to have a failure based off of the uh, PSA criteria. Once again, circling back to that UCLA group, looking at who's going to succeed versus fail with grade group 2 disease on biopsy, PSA does decrease, but the PSA by itself is not specifically predictive. When you look... PSA density generally is the best of our indicators, looking at likelihood of recurrence. However, overall PSA is going to decrease, but there is oftentimes not much of a difference in terms of overall volume. You really have to focus it back and look at the density. And this is group from, and this is just another study, this is from Dr. Tanasia's group, uh, that essentially says the same thing, that even though you have substantial declines or suspicious lesions, that is not necessarily predictive of, um, residual disease. Cryotherapy is an established long-term treatment for prostate cancer. 
oncologic ex uh, outcomes are excellent. There is improvement in urinary function. There is a decrease in sexual function. And the real question is, how do we follow these patients moving forward? Thank you.